Hello everyone, it is Toby from TIJ Music and welcome today to a new album review. The first time I've done this in over a month and I'm really glad to be back doing album reviews and hopefully now we will be having an album review at least once a week. But despite the Dark Side of the Moon shirt, we're not going to be reviewing Dark Side of the Moon today. Today we're going to be reviewing Rainbow's fifth studio album from 1981, Difficult to Cure. One of the few albums we've reviewed so far that I have got the vinyl record for. Really nice cover, uh, really distinct cover. They've got the back cover, which is cool as well. You can tell it's definitely got a medical theme uh, with the cover, as you can see, the inner sleeve. Uh, and also the lyrics covered by medical objects, but don't ask me to name any of them because I can only make a fool of myself. I'll stick to talking about music. Now, the album was out in, I mean, I know I'm covering my face here, but the album was brought out in 1981, the 3rd of February, 1981, released on the Polydor label, like every album that Rainbow released. Uh, around the world anyway since Rising. They released Richie Blackmore's Rainbow on, I forget what label it is now, in the UK. I think it was Oyster in the UK and possibly uh, Rising might have been released on Oyster in the UK, but certainly the rest of the world and uh, the UK by this point had uh, seen Difficult to Cure and the album before it, Down to Earth, rock, uh, Long Live Rock and Roll, and I think on stage the live album um, bought out on Polydor label. Now this, of course, was the fifth studio album, the first album uh, without um, Graham Bonnet since his one album stint in Down to Earth and of course Ronnie James Dio had gone by this point but the band's leader since the start was still there Richie Blackmore and he was joined by a few more members but just to talk about that uh, a little bit like oh no we can talk about that that's, that's next to the notes all right so this introduces um, as it says on the back I don't know if you can read that on the back there uh, it introduces new lead singer Joe Lynn Turner who would be in the band from this album all the way up until their last album, uh, officially, as I call it, probably before it was Richie Blackmore's Rainbow Again and all that nonsense in the late 90s. Uh, so we performed on three albums with them. Let me test myself on this. This album, Straight Between the Eyes in 82 and Bent Out of Shape in 83. Now, personally, I haven't listened to either of the other albums. Pardon me, but I'd love to give them a listen at some point uh, and possibly do a review of them. But just to see how they're like compared to this album. Uh, had a large amount of US success, did Jolene Turner, which the band hadn't had before. And again, apologies if this is your first video of mine. I do have my notes over here, so I don't fling from side to side. These are just my notes about some of the stuff. Uh, he was in the US band Fandango. He didn't actually have a lot of success, but uh, Jolene Turner being in the US himself managed to bring the band uh, some US success. So there was there was good things for both parties. Of course, Jolene Turner got success as a lead, as a lead singer in a big band. And of course, the US... Um, Bought into Rainbow, if you like, when Jolene Turner uh, joined. And as it says here, Turner would then work with Rainbow until the last 83 album. Now, Graham Bonnet left the album, had left the band, as I said, as well as Cozy Powell, the long-time drummer at Drummer. He'd been in since Rising, I think it was his first album. A uh, great sort of collection of musicians on the Rising album, which you can also find an album review of that on the channel. But I'm, I'm looking to reproduce that one at some point because I didn't have that one as a face cam. I just did that kind of scripted. And I'd quite like to do it a bit more relaxed like this one. But Cozy Powell, Graham Bonnet left bass they didn't like the material. Now, Cozy Powell definitely left because he thought the material was too poppy. Graham Bonnet, I don't know why he left. Well, it, was not, uh, it wasn't specific why he left, but he just didn't like the material. So in terms of other personnel, we've got Cozy Powell out, as I said. Bob Rondinelli comes in on drums. Um, Don Airy remains as well on the uh, keyboards. And Roger Glover is the producer um, and also the bass player um, from... Yeah, he's the bass player. And he is the producer for this album as well. Produced every uh, Rainbow album from Down to Earth, which is the previous album from 1979 uh, to the last album. Now, with this album, it's important to point out that Rainbow took a really commercial move with this. Now, they had the first three studio, uh, first three studio albums, four studio albums that they had. Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, Rising, and then Long Live Rock and Roll, which were really hard rock sounding with Ronnie James Dio. Then they went to Down to Earth, which is a little bit more commercial sounding. And with this album, they really went commercial sounding. And uh, Richie Blackmore, the band's leader, of course, former Deep Purple. I don't really need to tell you about it. Uh, Richie Blackmore, I wouldn't say if you're watching this video. But, uh, yeah, he took a lot of inspiration from the band Foreigner, who had had a hit that year in 1981 with Waiting for a Girl Like You. And he just took a more commercial sound. He, he wants to move through the times. And this is such an interesting topic that I could cover in a different video about all bands in the 80s, because... At the end of the 70s, you could really take two different directions. You could take the direction that groups like Rainbow, Queen and Kiss took and went more commercial. Did it work? It certainly worked for Queen. Didn't work for Kiss because they went back pretty quickly. And well, Rainbow were out by 83, so figure that out for yourselves. Or you could take the ACDC, um, Black Sabbath, I suppose, Judas Priest kind of thing of who cares about chart success and we'll stick to our guns and... 
And to this day, I think the ACDC, Judas Priest, etc. Uh, approach worked. But enough about that. But basically, they went very commercial here. And they didn't stick to their guns. But crucially, this was their most successfully commercial album. This went to number three in the UK albums chart, number nine in Sweden, and number 13 in Germany. So a pretty successful album. Although, as we're going to learn here, I, I hold this album with uh, a lot of... A lot of uh, a lot of good regard, I would say. I do really like this album, listening to it. And the front cover, as well as Rising, I mean, Rising and Difficult to Cure are the two rainbow albums I've listened to in full. Of course, I'm listening to snippets from other albums, but those are the two I've listened to in full. And I hold this album with really good regard, but actually going through my view in this, you can see how much of a mixed bag it is. But just a few reviews, other reviews, before we start. Pretty scathing from all music. Only a few uh, occasionally memorable tracks. Fairly undistinguished. I mean, if it's a bit harsh to call some of these tracks average. Each side ends with a pretentious shoot, a pseudo classical instrumental that functions as nothing more than a guitar showcase. That's very harsh. Um, but some of the user reviews on Rate Your Music were a little bit better. Uh, Martin Leedham didn't go down well, but brought in a large teenage audience, especially from the UK. Main single from the album went to number three on the charts. That was huge for a band like this at this sort of point. Um, BPN cast on Rate Your Music said it was a mixed bag. Bang on. Uh, and then Volgan on RMM, the 80s were always going to be more commercial, so who cares? And I think that's kind of the the uh, the approach I take to this. But there are definitely a few duds on this album, so we might as well get on with it uh, and talk about the nine tracks that make up the Difficult to Cure album. So let's get this open. I'll just quickly show you the vinyl record. This is an original vinyl uh, from 81. That is side one. Side, two, uh, side two's fired a little bit. That uh, looks a little bit better, side one, I always find. Side 2 has fired a little bit uh, more. Now, I do admit, I haven't listened to this on vinyl. I've listened to it on uh, CD. But uh, it'd be interesting to see how it does sound on vinyl at some point. But these are all old records that have been found out. So I haven't really had the chance to listen to this on vinyl. But just thought it'd be a nice uh, bit of uh, memorability to show you guys whilst I review the album. So the first track on the album, we have I Surrender, which is uh, the first... First single from the track, written by Russ Ballard, who made, uh, who made, who wrote uh, "Since You've Been Gone" as well, who, which was, of course, was uh, the main single from the Down to Earth album before this album. The uh, the most, uh, the best lead. Said, I can't get any words out today. The best single for Rainbow to that point, and that really marked uh, a bit of commercialisation. But as I've said before, this album marks real commercialisation. Uh, so as I said before, it went to number three in the UK charts at the exact time when "Shut Up Your Face" by Joel Dolce. Uh, had beaten up Vienna by Ultravox to the top spot, and now I know that I Surrender was third. I don't know how Shut Up Your Face got, I don't know how it got away with it, but it did, it got to number one, but oh well. Uh, yeah, it's a more of a pop rock track, it's a bit of a catchy sound which underlines the album, but I have to say, it's great vocals from uh, the new vocalist, Jolyn Turner, it's, it's really great vocals, and I like the track, it's a 7 out of 10 for me, I think, in terms of rating, because it's not a brilliant track, it's not a fantastic track, Certainly if we compare it to some of the earlier Rainbow work that was on, like, Rising, that is absolutely fantastic. I mean, I'd rate Stargaze from that album as a 9 or 10, so I can't, just out of appreciation for that track, I can't give this any more than a 7. But it's a good track. Uh, again, a lot of these are more of a poppy sound, but they're good songs within their own right. This is the problem when you're talking about an album like this. Do you take the approach that, I'm a Rainbow fan, this doesn't sound like Rainbow, or let's just appreciate the music for what it is, and I'm more the second as I've said, I can't really give this more than a 7 out of 10, but a good track uh, nonetheless. And Jolene Turner definitely suits the poppy style. Ronnie James Dio just definitely wouldn't. Uh, then we go into track 2, which wasn't a single, non-single track. And you can kind of tell it's not a non-single track, because it's a little less commercial. And this was Spotlight Kid, the second track. Again, for me, another 7 out of 10. A great guitar riff uh, from Richie Blackmore at the start of the track. Who would expect less? I'll put that in my notes. Who would expect less from Richie Blackmore? One of the best guitarists uh, in mine, and I'm sure a lot of other people's opinion of all time. Uh, another catchy track, but as I've just said, not as commercial as I Surrender. A bit more like the old Rainbow, but still not a perfect track. Track Still a good track, but again, very similar to I Surrender, and it's quite commercial. But the next track, track three, uh, no release, is definitely not commercial. It's a real nod back to the old Rainbow, I would say. Uh, a flashback back to the old sound, and for me, I don't know if this is the same for anybody else who's listened to this album. But no release... It doesn't sound like the same vocal I've heard on track one and two. I know it's Jolene Turner, but the vocals just sound a little bit different. I don't know if it's the sound of the song, whether it's the tone, whether it's a little bit lower, I'm not sure. Um, but this is an 8 out of 10 for me. A bit of a better track. 
Uh, it's still a little bit commercial with that whole backing track, can't get no release and all that. But some of it adds to it, like the, uh, the bit in the middle of the track where it builds up, can't get no, can't get no, can't get no release. That's a bit of an 80s thing, but it adds to the... It adds to the music, so while some of the 80s production values take things down a little bit, some things definitely do increase uh, the value of this record, definitely, with uh, tracks like No Release. Uh, great beat from Richie Blackmore, he's known for that, and uh, a great track. And contrary to what the music, uh, all music reviews said, certainly not easy forgettable. I've just remembered that I will probably tell you who's written all these tracks uh, as I go through them. I told you Russ Ballard wrote the first one. Uh, Blackmore and Glover, so main player, of course, main guitar player and bass player, Glover, Glover uh, wrote Spotlight Kid, and then Blackmore, Glover and Airy um, wrote the third track. Fourth track, you can definitely tell this is commercialised, it's Magic, the second single from the album, uh, the single that was released in Japan only, and didn't really do that fantastic, to be honest, it was obviously a commercial sounding track and a, a decent pop track but nothing more hence why this has to be a 6 out of 10 at most the lyrics are pretty meaningless and they just make a bit of a mockery of the rainbow name I mean let's just have a look at the lyrics some of the lyrics like I know who you are and there's magic in you it's not great is it but it's a decent track this one written by Moran who I don't know who that is I should have really researched that that's the only thing I didn't research I should have a look at that but uh no, someone outside the band wrote this and clearly hadn't got the songwriting ability that the other guys in the band had because it's a decent song. It would go in my 80s pop playlist quite easily, yeah, those kind of songs. But does it fit on a Rainbow album? No. So it's a decent track, but I can't give it above a six. And then we end side one. And for those of you who haven't listened to the album, you might get a bit confused by the comment that came out earlier about the pseudo-classical instrumentals that function no more uh, than a guitar showcase. Now, of course, on each side, well, on a record, there are two sides. So the A side finished with Velekt das Nächste Zit, or easier for me, uh, maybe next time. But the 1981 LP, which this is, um, was a mistranslation from the German. This says, as I've just read out, Velekt whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, and the corrected version... Uh, is Vilekt Beam Nachten Mal. I think I'll just put maybe next time on the on the picture up there, make it a bit easier for me. But unbelievably, uh, the later release still had multiple spelling errors. I mean, just, just call it maybe next time, for goodness sake. Uh, this is the B-side, Twice Surrender, and it's not much cop. Uh, it isn't much cop. It's not like the, the last track on the B-side, which you'll hear me talk about in a minute. In my opinion, it's not much cop. It's easily forgettable. On the album, I can skip it pretty easily. It's a 5 out of 10, because it's decent. It's a decent track, but really nothing more than that. Uh, so then we get into the second side of the album with the third and final single, uh, Can't Happen Here Again. Much like, like, much like, they're, they're, they're much like Spotlight Kid, written uh, co-written by Richie Blackmore and Roger Glover, Can't Happen Here. And this is a decent track. Uh, B-side was Jealous Lover, which is a non-album track. And this wasn't re uh, Jealous Lover wasn't recorded by the time the album came out. That was recorded in sort of June time. I presume it was anyway, because Can't Happen Here came out as a single in June and got to number 20 in the UK charts, which, considering the 80s scene, well, it was pretty impressive, really, for a uh, a decent single. A little bit better than the commercial sounding Magic, but it's got similar traits to that track, so it's not enough to quite get a 7 from me. Maybe a 6.5, but I'll give it a 6 nonetheless. It's uh, still a little bit poppy, uh, but a little bit better and a little bit deeper lyrically, because it's a little bit more of a, of a politically... Um, charged track with stuff like uh, satellite spying for the CIA, the KGB and the man in grey. Wonder if I'm going to see another day somewhere in the future. It's certainly thought provoking even nearly 40 years later now in uh, 2019 and maybe if you are watching this could be 40 years later, who knows, maybe even 50 years that's a scary thought. But uh, yeah, still a 6 and it's still got that kind of 80s sound but still a decent track, it gets a, gets a 6 from me. And then we go to the ultimate track, the last track that's got lyrics in, uh, and this is Midtown, Midtown Tunnel Vision, co-written by Blackmore, Glover and Turner. Now, out of all the tracks on the album, this was the one I looked at before doing this review and thought, I haven't heard that one that much, so I'll give it a listen. And I wasn't really that impressed. I'll give it a five. Uh, it seems a lot of other reviews have said the same. I don't like to copy what other reviewers say because, in the end of the day, it's my opinion you've come here for, not somebody else who's reviewed the album in the past. But they seem to think that freedom for... Oh, no, sorry. Let's uh, let's let's go back a little bit. 
it's not Midtown Tunnel Vision next. We've completely skipped Freedom Fighter, which other reviewers have called Freedom Fighter and uh, Midtown Tunnel Vision. They've caused both of these tracks forgettable. And that's what triggered me back. No, that Freedom Fighter. Don't go ahead of yourself too quick, Toby. Uh, Freedom Fighter, much like Midtown Tunnel Vision then, co-written by Blackmore, Glover and Turner. This is a great track, actually. It's a B-side to Magic. Should probably be in the A-side because Magic's just not as good as this track. It's a 7 out of 10 for me. Uh, it's a bit more politically motivated, again, with some of the lyrics. A little bit like, can't happen here. Uh, hide behind your politics, hide behind your rules. Tell me I'm a man, but you treat me like a fool. It's the same old story with the same uh, with a different name. You give us all a number and nothing changes. Again, a bit thought-provoking and, uh, and good lyrics, really. Uh, but yeah, a good song and a good catchy, uh, good catchy chorus, which is really what they were going for on this album with some of the tracks. And yeah, I'll give it a 7 out of 10, a good track. So it must, well, it's got to be forgettable for the fact I forgot it, but <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to move on now to Midtown Tunnel Vision, which I was part way through talking about. This, a decent track, but nothing fantastic. As I said, I listened to it uh, about an hour ago. Uh, in conjunction to listening to the whole of the album. I wasn't impressed. It's not a great track. I might, again, and these reviews are all retrospective of the time I'm doing them. I might like the track more as I listen to it more. But for me, it doesn't do anything for me. But, it's only a 5 out of 10. But I say but because we now move on to the title track, which comes at the end of the album. And I don't get how anybody would slate this. I'd, I'd love to argue and maybe discuss uh, this track with people who don't like it, because I don't understand how you can't like it. This is the only 10 out of 10 track on the album for me. This is up there with some of Blackmore's best work, Highway Star, Stargazer. The list goes on and on and on and on. It's had such a brilliant career, and that is difficult to cure. Based off Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Beethoven, Blackmore, I suppose start with the same letter, but it's a bit a bit different. It's inspired by Beethoven's Ninth, using the melody to Ode to Joy, but a fantastic instrumental, really good, rock-infused, and if ever this comes on in the car, while I'm walking, while I'm doing anything, it's a much li must listen. Pretty much all of the tracks on this album, if I'm not in the mood, I'll skip them. But this one never gets get skipped, and that is the mark of a really great song. In my opinion, anyway, it never gets skipped. It's an awesome track. Uh, it's an instrumental, and it just builds up fantastically. And I'll give you some other classic guitar solos, particularly from Pink Floyd, Money, Comfortably Numb. Um, not necessarily a guitar Charlotte solo, but Shine on You Crazy Diamond, uh, Stargazer by Rainbow, Highway Star by Deep Purple. These are all guitar solos and riffs that stick in your mind and give you goosebumps. And I think Difficult to Cure's up there with them. It's absolutely fantastic. Much better than maybe next time. A little bit 80s infused still with the, uh, like, I don't know what the sounds are, but like the middle of the song, you're a like those little sounds. Uh, but again, still a fantastic track. And really it rounds off the album so well and I think that the only good thing I'll take from this all music review which they slide to the album at 2 out of 5 the only good thing I'll take is that they said which is right when Blackmore put his mind to it it was really good some of the stuff on this album and that's exactly right uh, for the last track but again a little bit of a shame that some of the tracks don't come out as well as this now I did say at the start of this review that I was a little bit shocked at the final writing that came out this is just, if this is your first review you're watching of mine the only reason I do the rates for the individual songs because we take an average of those and then make an, a verdict, which is an average of all the scores. And that comes out at 6.7 out of 10. A little bit lower than I was thinking. I was thinking more, maybe more a 7 to 8 out of 10. I mean, if I moved Can't Happen Here up and stuff like that, then it could get to a 7. But I don't want to artificially affect the, the verdict here. So I'm a little bit surprised that it's only a 6.7 out of 10. But it is a mixed bag. I mean, as... We said at the start of the episode it is a mixed bag and that's the problem there are a few duds that let this album down i've reviewed quite a few albums now that there are some fantastic tracks on the album but ultimately the odd track really lets the uh, really lets the album down in terms of its rating but then even in my opinion fa uh, the rising album wasn't that well rounded there were some fantastic tracks there are only six tracks on that album you know, just talk a little bit, uh, I mean, not in detail, but stargazer tarot woman they're fantastic songs and then everything that comes in between isn't isn't great for me. They're good tracks, but nothing fantastic uh, compared to the tracks that bookend that album. So, really, even what I'm trying to say is even the best albums, potentially, uh, I mean, the real best albums are fantastic throughout. Uh, but Rainbow Horizon's another great album. Uh, but I'm going to end there. That is uh, my review of Difficult to Cure by Rainbow. A little bit of a long one. They all tend to be long ones these days. I feel like 
uh, I'll just talk at length about these albums because I want to do these albums justice uh, and talk about them and just talk about my thoughts about them. If you have listened to the album, let me know down in the comments what you think of it. Uh, and I've got plenty of album reviews of the Rising album. I've got some Pink Floyd, Queen, ACDC, Brian Adams, Bruce Springsteen, uh, and plenty more album reviews to come. Rock, pop, whatever uh, that comes to mind that I'll be doing on this channel in the next few weeks. So stick around for that. Subscribe if you are new. Comment down below your thoughts and also leave a like if you enjoyed. And if you've got any friends, any relatives that you know like Rainbow, like Deep Purple, even just like Richie Blackmore or even like Rock, that you think they quite like they quite like listening to this. Maybe for me, oh, my dad, like, my dad used to like them. He'd like this weird 18-year-old talking about this album. Uh, so if you know anybody like that, make sure to uh, share this video with them. But thank you very much for your company. I have been Toby from TIJ Music. 6.7 out of 10. The Difficult to Cure, a little bit shocked, not as good as I thought it was, uh, but still great to review. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye for now.